Hello, welcome back. It's our last lecture of the week, okay? Picking up with where the uh, last one left off, a little bit shorter. Hopefully this one will be similar, right? So let's, I don't know whether you can actually see this up here, but this is kind of, you know, a little bit of a takeaway from our last, um, the, the first lecture in this section on 11.6 series. Uh, so now what do we ask when we're looking at adding up infinitely many numbers series? Um, instead of just plain old convergence or divergence, now it's, is the convergence absolute, which we're super happy about, right? So that means we have nothing else to do. Absolute convergence tells us our guy, the original guy converged. Um, or is the convergence conditional if it's not absolute? Well, that we had a definition for last video, but we're going to work on um, how we test for that conditional convergence next week. That's section 11.5. We'll be going there. That's called the alternating series test. So um, that'll be next week. Um, so it's convergence or divergence, but now convergence, we've got to identify which of the two we have. Okay. All right. So um, what are we going to do today? So today my goal is now to give you these two important tests. We're going to prove them next week. Just want to get you moving on your homework so that you can start applying these tests. We'll have some examples. And then we will um, do some more with those and more and generalize a lot of stuff next week as well. So next week we're going to finish up um, 11.6. We'll also do 11.5 and then we will move into 11.8, which is power series, adding up functions, infinitely many functions as promised, right? Ready to go? Okay. So just as uh, one little reminder, right? Ratio test next week, I'll prove. I'll prove that next week. What do you think is gonna happen with the root test? You know, you know the drill by now, right? Good. You'll prove this is a homework problem. Yay. Right? Okay. All right. So, uh, but let's get a handle on what these tests say and how to use them. That's what our goal is really this week. So the ratio test, that's what usually what we call it or, or what we just say. What do we really mean? What's the long version? It's the ratio test for absolute convergence or divergence of some series, right? Okay. So um, I've written up the bones of the idea of the ratio test. If something is true, then we can conclude that the series converges absolutely. If something else is true, then we can conclude that the series diverged, right? This is the series we're interested in. And if something else is true, then the test basically tells us nothing, right? If the test could be inconclusive, the test fails to tell us anything. We're super sad about that. We haven't had a test like that yet, right guys? Okay. Think about all of our other previous tests. Whatever comp computation you did for any of the previous tests, they always gave you a conclusion, converge or diverge. Yeah? Okay? Now, all of a sudden, we could go through a bunch of work and have the test not tell us anything. Okay? So, um, all right. So, let's, uh, I guess, really, the only place we kind of saw that is if you picked the wrong comparison series with the limit comparison test. So if you didn't pick the right comparison series with the limit comparison test, the LCT, then you could have ended up in a case where your comparison series didn't actually tell you anything about the series you're interested in. So maybe we do have a little bit of experience with that. And if you do have some experience with that, then you know that's annoying, right? Okay. And so we want to try to get a handle on when that's going to happen ahead of time so we don't find ourselves constantly in this case. Yeah? All right. You ready to see what this guy tells us? Okay, so what is the ratio test where we're testing for either absolute convergence or divergence of a series, hoping we don't end up in the inconclusive test uh, um, case, right? What do we do? Well, just like the limit comparison test, we're taking a limit. So we're going to be looking at a limit as n goes to infinity of something, okay? Now, um, the nice thing about the ratio test compared to the limit comparison test is that you don't have to come up with anything at all. Like, you know, with limit comparison, you needed your comparison series. You had to cleverly choose it. 
But with the ratio test, you just put, you, the limit that you have to compute is determined directly from your series. There's nothing else to do. So that's kind of awesome, right? And it's for absolute convergence, so we're taking the limit of the absolute value of stuff, right? Because we need stuff to be positive, okay? And it's a ratio, right? So that's the whole deal. It's a ratio, so we're taking the limit of a ratio. So what do you know a ratio means? Good, a fraction, right? So now the question is only, what goes in the fraction, yeah? So you won't forget the absolute value and you won't forget the, the fraction. And what goes in the fraction? It's the next term in the series divided by the previous term in the series. The next term in the series, in general, divided by the previous term in the series. So how do we say that in math? A sub n plus 1. We like using plus, okay? So a sub n plus 1 divided by? Good. A sub n, right? The next term divided by the previous term. This guy is given to you. This guy, you just put an n plus 1 everywhere there was an n, right? And then we're going to have to do some... some um, some fraction math and limits. Yay! Right? That's pretty much all it's been. Fraction math and limits. All right. So this, whoops, this is the limit we want to compute, right? And now, once we compute this limit, what are we looking for to be in the absolutely convergent um, case? You compute this limit, right? And if, if this limit is equal to some number L, Okay, L is a real number, okay? Um, and that number L is less than one, okay? So what does that really mean for this case, right? We're taking a limit of an absolute value. So the smallest this thing is always positive, right? So the smallest that this thing could ever be in a limit is zero, right? So the smallest L could ever be is zero. So L is greater than or equal to zero and strictly smaller than one. That's what you're looking for. If you compute this limit, and, and you can see why I didn't want to like, teach this stuff before our last test, right? Um, because these results are very different than P-series results, right? What do we get if that limit is less than 1 and greater than or equal to 0? We get absolute convergence, right? So again, you've got to keep all of these results straight, um, which is why whenever you compute one of these things, you want to say what you're looking for as well before you make your, con your conclusion. All right, so if the limit of that ratio is a number which is smaller than one and bigger than or equal to zero, we're golden. We've got absolute convergence, right? And what does absolute convergence mean? All right, absolute convergence, that means the sum of the absolute values converges. And what did we just show last time? The sum of the absolute value converges means the series itself converges, right? Another way to say this super short is that absolute convergence implies convergence, right? Those two things are the exact same thing. Absolute convergence implies convergence. So we're loving it when we're here, right? We've got absolute convergence there. We for the, if I turned all the, the negative terms into positives and added them up, that series would converge. Since the bigger series converges, the smaller series is guaranteed to converge, right? Different sums, both converge. Awesome. We got that now, yes? You ready for the next piece? Okay, it's the same limit. You keep computing the same limit. So if you compute this limit, absolute value a n plus 1 over a n, the ratio of the next term to the previous term, right? And if that limit is greater than 1, if that limit is greater than 1, what does that mean, right? So either it equals a number L, which is greater than 1, or the limit goes off to infinity, grows unbounded, right? Okay. So if the limit is greater than 1, either it's some number that's bigger than 1, or it goes off to infinity, grows unbounded, doesn't exist, then what can we conclude? Then your immediate conclusion is, is that the original series diverged, okay? The original series diverged. Okay, um, finally, what is the only case left for this limit? Good. If the limit, as n goes to infinity, of my ratio, absolute value of my ratio, if that limit is actually 
but on equal to one, I'm super, super, super sad, right? Why? The test is inconclusive. The test fails to tell us anything. If that limit ends up being identically one, then you did all this work for nothing. What do you got to do? Use another test. Like what you say? 11.2 to 11.4 tests, right? There's a reason we learned those guys. Geometric series, P series, integral test, limit comparison test, comparison test. You got to use one of those, right? So we need to get uh, develop some instincts about when we're going to end up in this case so that we don't waste a bunch of time. Yeah? Good. Um, all right. Make sense? We're going to do some examples. Before we do examples, um, you're going to have to wait till next week. We're going to prove parts one and two. Let's prove um, part three right now. Okay. So in order to justify part three, maybe I'll just erase this piece right here. So to justify part three, Uh, we can simply demonstrate two different series with different behaviors that uh, have limits of one here, right? So to, just, to, justify, to justify part three, let's consider um, the sum of one over n squared. One over n squared is what type of a series? It's a p series, right? Yeah, what's p? p is two, what do we care about? is bigger than one that means this series converges right so we know that series converges but suppose we tried the ratio test suppose we didn't think ahead of time and we tried the ratio test for this series right then what would the limit what limit would I compute right the limit as n goes to infinity the absolute value of a n plus 1 over a n well, here our a n is 1 over n squared. It's always positive, so the absolute values don't even cause us an issue. It would be the limit as n goes to infinity of, okay, you know, it might even be easier for you to write a n first. a n is 1 over n squared, right? He's in the denominator. So what would go in the numerator, right? It would be a, this guy, right? Here's your a n is 1 over n squared. So what is a n plus 1? Just like function notation. You're putting an n plus 1 everywhere you see an n, right? So it's 1 over n plus 1 squared. Yes? Okay. So 1 over n plus 1 quantity squared. Yeah? All right. This is fraction limit over fraction over fraction. We promised you you'd get lots of these, right? Simplify this fraction to a single fraction. What do I get? n squared over n plus 1 squared. Right? Yeah? That's... This fraction is equivalent to this guy. Now again, you could do L'Hopital's rule. You could, uh, this is infinity over infinity. You could expand this out, right? It's actually simpler if we think about it this way. The limit as n goes to infinity of n over n plus 1 quantity squared, right? Just for fun, we'll just try to, you know, we're getting bored with these, so we might as well just, like, you know, at least uh, switch up the way we solve them. Um, so that limit is the same as this limit, right? And um, we also know, right, that was just algebra of fractions, right, and exponents, right? Um, now we can use the fact that the, the limit of something to a power is the limit of that thing raised to the power, right? So, you know, the, we can bring the limit inside, yeah? Just reinforcing some of your limit rules and limit tools and limit strengths, right? <laughs> You're going to need all the power of your limit toolbox to help you through the next um, piece of the semester. All right, and so this is still a limit of infinity over infinity, but what we do, divide by the highest uh, power in the denominator, so that's the same as the limit as n goes to infinity 
uh, what is this guy? And then we would square it, right? So if I divide everything by n, I would have 1 over 1 plus 1 over n. We're getting so good at this now, we're, it's like annoying to us. And then this guy goes to zero, and therefore, what would we get out of here, right? We would get the limit, and then goes to infinity of one over one plus zero. One over one plus zero is one, so one squared, which is one, right? And so here we did a series, a P series, which we knew converged. We tried the ratio test. We ended up with one. What is the conclusion? And so, so. What, we got one, so what we're trying to do right now is justify that when you get one, the test is inconclusive. So here we've just found a convergent series where the limit is one. So if we're trying to justify that if you get one from this limit, the test is inconclusive, what's the other thing we have to do yet? Find a, what type of series? Good, divergent series, yeah, that. We apply the ratio test and get, good, we get one again, and then we will have an example of a convergent series where that limit is one, and a divergent series where that limit is one, and that tells you, well, well, if you get one, you can't, you can't just, you can't conclude anything. So, what's your favorite divergent series? Aha! Let's consider. I'm just going to erase stuff, right? Make my life simpler. Um, let's consider. Good. I heard you say it. One over n, right? It's a p series with p equals one, right? It's also known as the harmonic series, the p equals one case, right? And so p equals one is less than or equal to one. And so what do we know about such a series? It diverges. So we know that series diverges, but suppose we didn't think about it and we tried the ratio test, right? And if we tried the ratio test, um, then what would we get? Look how nice this is. Woohoo, right? Um, we would have this, this guy, which would be this guy, right? Which would be the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over 1 plus 1 over n. There we are again. This guy does what? Goes to zero, so this limit is one over one plus zero, which equals one. Whoops, one, right? So we now have an example of a diversion series where I compute this limit and I get one, which justifies the fact that there's, you know, if you get one, you can't make any conclusion. The series could diverge or the series could converge like our previous one. Make sense? Awesome. Okay. So now we are going to do an example. I'm going to leave this up. So we're going to scoot this out a little bit, turn to our other side. Whoops. And we're going to come back to this a little bit later. The magic of whiteboards in your third floor office slash bedroom space. All right, okay, here we go. Oh, let me just double check that we're still on the camera here and you can still see, yes you can. Okay, so let's look at an example now, okay? Let's do another homework problem, yay! It's always fun to do homework problems, right? Um, here's 11.6, number 33. Okay, um, homework. N equals one to infinity minus nine to the N divided by N times 10 to the N plus one. Okay, I'm not exactly sure what the directions say. We're just gonna do what we wanna do anyway. Um, so our goal is to test for um, convergence or divergence, right? And so convergence or divergence means absolutely convergent or conditionally convergent. Since we haven't told you how to do conditionally convergent yet, we better hope that we either get absolute convergence or divergence. Yeah? Okay, good. All right, so um, this is another homework problem. We already did a homework problem number four last time. 
Um, number four, you can try it for yourself. If you tried the ratio test with number four, you would end up in the inconclusive case, okay? Um, here, we've got exponential functions, right? Constant to an exponent, and the n is changing. So exponents are a good place for ratio test. So ratio test good with exponents and factorials. Those are some of your keys, right? Uh -uh, get it, factorials. Uh -uh. Um, those are some of your clues that maybe the ratio test is the place to go, especially a factorial, okay? Especially a factorial. Um, so, um, but ratio test is not good with polynomials and other things as well. All the kinds of problems you've been doing, okay, um, except for geometric series because they're exponents, um, all the kinds of problems you do, you've been doing is not good for the ratio test in general, right? Um, so that's why you need those other tests. All right, so let's think about this guy. So again, um, we know we're in section 11.6, so we know we're going to try the ratio test, but you know, let's think about this. We kind of see a little geometric series going on here, negative 9 to the n over 10 to the n, right? 9 tenths to the n. So, you know, 9 tenths to the n, what does that make you think? Well, negative 9 tenths to the n, right? That, that would be an r, right, of negative 9 tenths. Absolute value of r is smaller than 1. Geometric series would suggest converging. So that instinct suggests that we think this guy could possibly converge. You know, this extra 1 is a... Uh, extra constant in the denominator, but this extra n, you know, you don't know what's going to happen, right? You could think of it as 1 over n times that, and 1 over n diverges, so, you know, who knows what happens, right? And you can't use a comparison test, right, because these guys don't have all positive terms, right? And so, limit comparison test, comparison tests are out, and therefore, um, you know, it, it's just simpler to go straight to the app, the ratio test for absolute convergence, right? So that these kind of mindset things, processing, mental processing, is one of the things you also want to try to be doing while you're doing these problems. Don't just do them blindly, right? Think about the process. Why are you doing what you're doing? Okay, so let's try um, the ratio test for absolute convergence, right? Don't forget that or absolute convergence or divergence, right? That's what we're looking for, right? That's what this ratio test is going to give us, okay? All right, so um, what do we need to do? Well, let's not get too crazy here. Um, so let's look at this guy. So remember, what does the ratio test mean we need to look at? We need to look at the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n, right? Okay? Now, let's go up here to the side, okay? If I'm doing this, right, then that's the same as the absolute value of an plus 1 over the absolute value of an. Rules of absolute values, right? We've gone over that a thousand times, yeah? Okay? Absolute value truth, right? So here's my an, right? So let's look at the absolute value of an, okay? For this problem, an... Um, is negative 9 to the n, right, this is my guy, this guy right here, he's my a sub n, right, yeah, so the absolute value of a n is then just the absolute value of negative 9 to the n over n times 10 to the n plus 1, yeah, okay, what is that going to be equal to? We don't have to go through a gazillion steps and carrying through a bunch of negative things like your book does, right? So the denominator is always positive, right? n is bigger than or equal to 1. 10 is positive, right? So the denominator is just n times 10 to the n plus 1. In the numerator, I've got this negative 9 to the n, right? Well, what is the absolute value of negative 9 to the n? Yeah, it's 9 to the n, right? So don't be carrying a bunch of negative, right, things through in the absolute value, right? Let's let's see what we are going to have to pay attention to later. Um, so a little 
more, uh, uh, a little more insight, maybe. Something that will be important to pay attention to later. If I think about negative 9 to the n, that is the same as negative 1 times 9 to the n. Do you guys agree with that? Right? Negative 9 is negative 1 times 9. Very nice. Rules of exponents. Negative 1 times 9 to the n is the same as, you got to distribute the exponent to each product, right? Each piece of the product. So that's negative 1 to the n times 9 to the n, right? Yeah? Are we good here? Negative 1 to the n does what? Now we're back to the very beginning of chapter 11. That's a sequence that does what? It just alternates back and forth between negative 1 and 1, right? Plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1. In this case, if n is 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, right? Yeah? Okay, good. And so then if I want to do the absolute value of that thing, right? Then this guy is just the guy changed in sign, right? This is positive, and so I've got my 9 to the n. That's kind of what happened from here to there, right? Yeah? Okay? Are y'all good to hear? All right. So don't get lost in all the extra negative one to the, you know, so anyway, go straight to here. So here we are, but understand why. All right. Anyway, um, so we're going to compute this limit, yeah? So what do we want to do? Well, we've got our, we want our absolute value of an plus 1 over an. So we just, we're going to put my my denominator, here's my big fraction. That's this fraction right here, okay? Because I know it's fraction over fraction. Um, and my a n in absolute value goes to the bottom, right? So that's 9 to the n divided by n times 10 to the n plus 1, right? Good. That's my absolute value of a n down there, yeah? And then the absolute value of a n plus 1 is going to go to the top, right? So what is a n plus 1, right? Or the absolute value of a n plus 1. The absolute value of a n plus 1, here's our absolute value of a n, it's this guy. So what do I do? I put an n plus 1 everywhere I see an n, right? So that's 9 to the n plus 1 divided by, here's an n, so what does n get replaced with? Good. n plus 1, nice. Here's an n, so what does n get replaced with? All right, 10 raised to the n plus 1, right, plus 1. Right? Yeah? That's a sub n plus 1. Are we good? Okay. So, um, I'm just going to kind of leave this this way. This is, let's just write it over here. This is 9 to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 times, what is n plus 1 plus 1? Good. It's n plus 2. Right? That's one way to write it, right? Another way to write it would be what, um, what I'm going to do when we move it up here in just a minute. What do I want to do first? Um, yeah, just trying not to confuse you. Let's just actually stick this up there just so that you see what we're doing. Okay? So let's put that up there. I'm going to make myself some more space. This one goes in the numerator, so here's my absolute value of a n plus 1. It is 9 to the n plus 1 all divided by n plus 1 times 10 raised to the n plus 1 plus 1, right? All I did was put that right up there. And it's not a bad idea to not go doing too much simplifying, just to make sure you can kind of look at it and be like, oh yeah, that's a n plus 1 divided by a n, right? All right, so now, whoops, what did we forget? Oh, the limit, we know we can't do that, right? The limit as n goes to infinity. Very nice. All right, so what is this equal to? It's the limit as n goes to infinity. Now it's nothing but a big fraction exponent mess, right? And you just need to simplify it to a single fraction and get cancel as much as possible, right? So this piece, right, stays on top. So it's 9 to the n plus 1. I'm just going to take extra steps this time. 9 to the n plus 1 um, divided by n plus 1 times 10 to the n plus 1 plus 1, right? I haven't done anything. All I'm doing is fraction math right now. And then I'm going to multiply, right, in order to deal with this guy. What am I going to multiply by? Good. 
n times 10 to the n plus 1 divided by 9 to the n, right? The reciprocal, yeah? Now this is all going to go way faster at some point, um, but I just want to make sure we all know what we're doing. So again, you might want to try it as we go through here, see why I'm kind of leaving this as 10 to the n plus 1 plus 1 instead of 10 to the n plus 2. If it confuses you, just make it 10 to the n plus 2. All right, so what do we have? We've got the limit as n goes to infinity. Now, here's what I want to see from you, right? Just like before when I said no crazy slashing unless you see exactly, you've got to do all your factoring first, you've got to use the rules of exponents before you start saying a bunch of stuff cancels, right? So it is not okay to start slashing things, this cancels, this cancels, that cancels. That is absolutely not okay. You will not get credit for that kind of work, right? I need to see you use rules of exponents um, and use limits properly to evaluate things like this. So what is that guy, this numerator? 9 to the n plus 1 by rules of exponents. How can I rewrite 9 to the n plus 1? I think I heard someone say 9 to the n times 9 to the 1, right? That 9 doesn't look like a 9. 9 to the n times 9 to the 1, right? That's what this piece is. 9 to the n times 9 to the 1, right? Okay, 9 to the 1 is just 9, yeah? So this is where you'll start picking up speed. The denominator is n plus 1, um, the first piece of the denominator. Well, actually, let's just keep doing the numerator, right? We got a product of fractions, so I got that times n times that guy, right? So times n times 10 to the n plus 1, yeah? Now, I could write that as 10 to the n times 10 to the 1. It's up to you, right? There's a reason why I didn't. N plus 1 is now down the bottom. Let's finish the denominator. Times, now, how do I run and rewrite my 10 to the n plus 1 plus 1? Yeah, that's 10 to the n plus 1 times 10 to the 1, right? Times 10, right? So it's up to you if we would have done 10 to the n plus 2. That's 10 to the n times 10 squared, right? And then you would have had to rewrite 10 to the n plus 1 as 10 to the n times 10, and then you would have had a 10 over 10 squared to cancel. You can think about that if you need to, okay? Um, we still have our 9, 9 to the n down there. I don't care how you do it as long as you do it correctly, okay? Um, with legitimate algebra. Now I'm in a place where I can clearly see products of things that I can easily cancel. So I'm going to use blue to cancel. I've got a 9 to the n on top and a 9 to the n on the bottom. So those guys cancel. That's legit, right? Um, what else cancels? I've got a 10 to the n plus 1 on top and a 10 to the n plus 1 on the bottom. So those guys cancel. That's legit, right? Does anything else cancel? Right. No, 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 and no, right? What am I left with? What I'm left with is a 9 on top and a 10 on bottom. These guys are both what? constants, right? Okay. These guys are constants. So nine tenths is a constant that I could pull out of this limit if I wanted. Nine over 10, right? Okay. Can I pull out the n? No, it's a limit as n goes to infinity, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm just going to pull my nine tenths out, right? That's where that came from. Times the limit as n goes to infinity of what's left is the stuff that depends on n, n divided by n plus one. Oh, right, we've seen that limit before, yeah, right? Now you could leave the 9 tenths inside if you want, it doesn't matter, okay? Um, it's all up to how you prefer to do it. You could have 9n divided by 10 times n plus 1. Um, but what is our goal? This is infinity over infinity. What do we have? There's my 9 tenths constant multiple coming along for the ride. This limit, you can use those L'Hopital's rule on that piece, or it's way simpler to just write it like this. We know that one, and again, this keeps coming up, so we want to reinforce it. The limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over something growing without bound is going to 0. 1 over something growing without bound is going to 0, right? So what do we have left here then? 9 tenths times the limit as n goes to infinity of this expression. What's the limit of the numerator? 
one, right? So the denominator, one plus zero, right? One over one plus zero is one. So what do we got? Nine tenths. Woohoo! What were we doing? Oh, yeah, right. We were trying the ratio test. Yeah? What do we care about with the limit that comes out of the ratio test? <gasps> this is our guy L, right? We care that L is less than one, right? Okay? That's our L. If L is less than one, right, then what do I know? The ratio test gives absolute convergence for that series. Since the series converges absolutely, the series converges, right? We have absolute convergence and we're golden. Yeah, does that make sense? Okay. And so there are a couple of things in here, dealing with the ratio, dealing with the fraction, dealing with the limit, dealing with the negative, okay? All of those things are gonna keep coming up and those are things we wanna make sure we uh, wanna be able to do. Make sense? We're gonna keep on going here in just a sec. We're happy, we love it, whenever we do the ratio test and we either get something that's less than one or greater than one. Then we have, can, can immediately make a convert, uh, converge or diverge, absolute convergence or divergence decision. Otherwise, we gotta do more work, right? You ready to do another example? Okay, let's see, where are we? Um, okay, well, actually, before we do another example, um, let's learn a new test, right? Just because I want to equip you as much as possible for what you are going to be doing this weekend, which is working on 11.6 web assign and uh, textbook homework, which deal with absolute convergence, ratio test, and root test. So the goal now is, ta -ta -ta -ta, what is the root test, right? Let me double check that we have on the screen. Yes, we do. Okay, what's the root test? Well, I purposely made my life better here as well. Um, so, there we go. The root test is just going to have a different limit. compute, obviously, we're no longer going to compute a ratio, right? Doesn't make sense, right? Ratio test to compute a ratio limit. The root test is going to have a different limit that we compute, but every piece of the rest of it is exactly the same, okay? So if what you compute the limit, and you, well, let's just say what you're supposed to compute, okay? So um, what does the root test for absolute convergence or divergence of a series say, okay? Um, so with roots, right, what do you think of, right? You think of taking the root of something. We often think of taking the square root of something, right? But what is this? Good, that's an N. So this is the, sorry, you tried to get my arm out of the way, the nth root of something right? That's why it's called the root test. We take the nth root of something. What's another way to write the nth root of a thing? If I don't want to use that notation. Good. Thing to the one over n, right? Yeah? Okay. Both are nth roots, and that's what we do to um, utilize the root test. So what limit are we going to do? We're going to do the limit as n goes to infinity, of what, and it's an absolute convergence, right? And so we need absolute values, right? So we want the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value. So here's what's kind of nice. Just take the absolute value of the a n guy, right? You don't even have to create like a n plus one for this guy, right? You just, whatever was here, you put slap absolute values around it, which means you just ignore the negative, right? Um, and then what you do with it though, you take the nth root right okay um so then you take that limit and see what you get 
if that limit is a number that is greater than or equal to zero or less than one, right? And less than one, right? A number that's smaller than one, again, this is positive, so it's never gonna be, you're never gonna get a negative out. If you get a negative out, you did something wrong, okay? Um, the smallest that L could ever possibly be in the limit is zero, okay? So if you're, root you do this limit and you get out of the root test a number that is greater than or equal to zero or smaller than one we're golden absolute convergence this convergence if we compute the limit of the nth root of the absolute value of the nth term and we get anything that's bigger than one from that limit so either a real number that's bigger than one or the limit goes off to infinity, grows without bound, then we can immediately conclude that our original series diverged, right? And similarly, if we are in the case where we take the nth root of the absolute value of our nth term and we get one, the test is inconclusive, the test fails to tell us anything, right? Which is the same thing, we're sad, because why? Because we know nothing, right? We know nothing. We went through all that work and we know nothing, right? Okay? Um, and what do you got to do? You got to go back and use one of your other tests. Yeah? All right. So, um, we already uh, talked about case three of the ratio test and gave demonstration of why that guy... Um, is inconclusive. Remember your homework, one of your homework problems is to prove the root test, so you could attempt number three after maybe we do a little example here uh, of something else and try to see if you can come up with two series. Just try applying the same two series that we used for the ratio test and see if you can come up with um, really can you do the limit, right? So that's what we're going to do right now is a limit just to make sure we're all um, up to speed with these limits. Yeah, you ready? Okay, here we go. Maybe I'll we'll just come back over here. Oop, I gotta pull it up. Um, while I'm turning this, let me just say that um, what we had written about the ratio test, about when it fails, oh, look, right here, right? Um, it's not good with polynomials, neither is the root test. Okay, the root test is going to fail then too. In fact, if the ratio test is going to fail, so is the root test. Maybe you can try to think about why that might be true. Um, the root test is good with exponents, but not factorials. Okay, and it's also not good with polynomials. Okay, it will fail. So if you tried the ratio test, for example, and it failed, well, the root test is also going to fail. And what do I mean by fail? Fail to tell you anything, right? End up in case three. Get one out of the limit, okay? So it never makes any sense to uh, have tried the root test, got one from the limit, and then try the ratio test. The only, the only way that would help you is if you did your limits wrong. Um, but let's not go there. All right, so let's come back, actually. To this problem number 33 and do it with um, the root test in fact just to kind of see that you can do problems um, you know with either test a lot of them except the factorials right because we don't have anything about taking limits of factorials all right so back to number 33 this time we are going to do what we're going to try the root test okay so, since we're going to try the root test, then we're going to have entirely different computations. So, I'm just going to erase all of this now. Now, we know the answer here, so we know what we ought to be expecting. But let's just see how it plays out. The calculations this time. Try the root test now. Yay! All right. I think this might be where we end. Uh, we may try to do one more problem after this. We'll see. Okay. So let's try the root test. 
All right, so what does the root test mean we want to look at? The limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a n to the 1 over n, right? The nth root of a n. Okay, so remember, we had already talked about our absolute value of a n for this guy. What is it? It's 9 to the n over n times 10 to the n plus 1, right? So now it's super useful for us to say, well, that's 9 to the n over n times 10 to the n times 10, right? Yeah, 10 to the n plus 1 is 10 to the n times 10 to the 1, right? Okay, so what do we want to do? Then we're going to come up here and we're going to say, okay, well, let's compute the limit as n goes to infinity of this expression to the 1 over n. I don't need absolute values anymore because I've already taken the absolute value of this guy, right? That's what got rid of that negative, negative 1 to the n in there for me, right? Just swaps back and forth between plus and minus 1. All right, so this is what I want, 9 to the n over n times 10 to the n times 10, right? Can you see that? Okay, yes? Well, we love this algebra as long as you know your rules of exponents, right? Rules of exponents. So what do we got to do, right? We've got a fraction and we've got nothing but products in here, right? And so what do we need, right? This 1 over n has to get applied to every single term, right? Every single term. So I'm going to do this slowly just to make sure we all see it. The limit as n goes to infinity. So what do we have? 9 to the n to the 1 over n divided by n to the 1 over n times 10 to the n to the 1 over n times 10 to the 1 over n, right? Every single one of those guys has to get the nth root taken of it, yeah? So that's that limit. Now it seems like this looks worse, right? Why would we do that? But it's not worse, right? Because what is 9 to the n to the 1 over n? Just to make sure we all see it, what do you do when you raise an exponent to another exponent? You multiply, right? That's the same as 9 to the n over n, which is 9 to the 1, which is 9, right? Yes, yay! So we have the limit as n goes to infinity. What is this? Oh, we're not doing any calculus here. This is just algebra. Algebra of exponents, 9 to the n to the 1 over n, you just told me is? Good, 9. Okay, does this simplify? Uh-uh, n to the 1 over n. That's an n, man, right? We're gonna have to look at that in a sec. What about this? Does this simplify? 10 to the n to the 1 over n? Yes, same thing, right? 10 multiply. What am I left with here? 10. Yes? That's what that guy is. And then this one is it? Nothing. I can't change that guy at all. It's 10 to the 1 over n, right? Okay. Oh, well, look, here's our 9 tenths again. These are constants. They're being multiplied. I can pull out multiplying constants. Can I pull out either of these guys? Absolutely not, right? N is what is changing. That has an N in it, right? It has lots of N's in it. That has an N in it. So no way, right? No way. So you don't have to pull out the 9 tenths, but I'm just going to just to highlight what's left to consider. This is the 9 tenths times the limit as n goes to infinity of what's left on top if I pull out the 9, good, a 1, and then what's left on the bottom, n to the 1 over n times 10 to the 1 over n. Yeah? So now it all comes down to can we do this limit of each one of these guys? They look kind of similar, but let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. All right, so these limits are the key. So let's do that here. Let's stop using blue for a minute. So first, let's do the one with the constant in it, 10, right? We really need to take the limit as n goes to infinity, right? Because we're using the quotient rule for limits. The limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits, right? And then we're using the product rule for limits. The limit of the product is the product of the limits. So we've got to apply this limit to each one die, right? Each one of those guys. So we need to know what is the limit 
is n goes to infinity of 10 to the 1 over n. Now, is this a limit we can immediately determine? Good job, right? 10 is a constant. 10 stays 10, right? n's going to infinity. Where does 1 over n go? Is the denominator grows huge? Good. Is 10 to the 0 a problem? No. What is 10 to the 0? It's 1, right? So this limit is just 1. Yeah? Are we good there? Fantastic. In fact, right? In fact, would it be any different if there was a 5 here? The limit is n goes to infinity of 5 to the 1 over n. So that would go to 5 to the 0, which is 1. What if it was pi? Pi to the 0, 1. 5,347,212 to the 0 is 1, right? Yeah? Right? In fact, if I have the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the 1 over n, right, where x is a positive number, okay, some positive real number, then what does that go to? x is some positive real number, right, positive, um, so we get x to the 0, if x isn't 0, right, some positive number raised to the 0 power is 1, right? So that's actually pretty cool and something we'll use quite a bit. The limit as n goes to infinity of uh, x to the n is 1 for x positive. Another way to say that is the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of x to the n. Sorry, 1 over n. What am I doing? Right? I'm just trying to rush at the end. <laughs> or what you're hoping is the end. What I'm hoping is not the end. Um, that's just not good. I just need to erase this. All right. Um, the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the 1 over n is equal to 1 if x is positive. Another way to say that is that the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of x to the 1 over n is always 1 as well. And here we're basically thinking of x as in 0, right? She, it's probably that these guys are going to come up, don't you think? Anyway, um, all right, so we got that, yeah? That guy goes to 1. What's left? n to the 1 over n. So let me ask you this. Okay, now I'm just going to change this, right? Okay, so what if I'm now, now I'm going to figure out what's happening with n to the 1 over n, the nth root of n. What is the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of n? So this guy's growing huge without bounds, and this guy, right, wants to take its nth root. But can I apply this rule right here? What do you think? What do you think? Why can't we? Why is this rule, as developed, totally wrong for this? Totally wrong. Here, x has nothing to do with n, right? As far as n is concerned, x is constant. n is the variable, n is moving. x is some fixed real number, right? It's not moving. Is the same true here? No, it's moving, right? So these are totally different. Totally, totally different. Yeah? What, in fact, does this approach, if we just thought about it, well, this guy's going to infinity, and this guy's going to uh, zero. What's that? Don't say one. What is it? I heard it. You're yelling it now in indeterminate form. What do we do with such indeterminate forms? I'm going to erase this now. What do we do with such indeterminate forms? So we're going to do this one this time, and then you're going to have this result. Like you're going to want to hold on to this result. It's going to be very useful. OK, what do we do with indeterminate forms? Um, here we go. So we want to compute that limit, right? So what is the limit? Um, 
as n goes to infinity. And now, just to not confuse you, I'm going to keep it as n and not switch it to x. We're going to end up using L'Hopital's rule, but I'm not going to switch to x just based on what we just talked about. Right? I just don't want you to totally lose it here. So we're going to take. We need to do this limit, right? But instead, we want this, right? Instead, what do we do in cases like this? We take the natural log of the limit, right? Exponent indeterminate forms, we take the natural log of the limit. So we take the natural log of the limit as n goes to infinity of n to the 1 over n, right? What do we know? We know that that's the same by our nice limit laws and continuity rules that as the limit as n goes to infinity of the natural log of n to the 1 over n, right? We can swap the limit and the natural log. What's beautiful about that, right, is that we can use rules of exponents, right, for logs, the rule of exponents for logs to say I can bring that guy down to the front, right? Natural log of a to the b is b to the natural log of a. So this is the limit. You've done this several times with problems, right? It's not going away, so sorry. Um, bring that guy down 1 over n times the natural log of n, right? Using the algebra. Now what do I want to do? Well, to use L'Hopital's rule, I need a fraction, right? Well, this is an automatic fraction, right? This is the same as the limit as n goes to infinity of natural log of n over n. Yes? 1 over n times natural log of n. Fraction rule. Fraction math. This is infinity over infinity, right? This is actually another important limit that we're going to see next time, just really what it's telling us as well. Um, but for right now, it's just infinity over infinity, so we want to do L'Hopital's rule, right? So now I'm going to do L'Hopital's rule, and I'm going to leave it as n, even though I know I really ought to change it to x, a continuous variable. Um, but from here out, we'll pretend that n is continuous, and we'll go back to Anyway, um, so what do I do with L'Hopital's rule? I take the derivative of the top. What's the derivative of natural log of n with respect to n? 1 over n, right? What's the derivative of the bottom? What's the derivative of n with respect to n? Good. 1, right? OK? So what are we left with then? Fraction math. This is the limit. And then goes to infinity of 1 over n. <laughs> this is our favorite guy, right? Have we seen this a thousand times? What happens to 1 over something getting huge? A constant over something getting huge is 0. Whew. Are we done? No, we are not done. What did we do? We did the natural log of the limit, right? The natural log of the limit is 0. How do we get what the actual limit is? Good, good, good. You guys are right there with me. We want this limit, so what is this limit? In order to get that limit, we have to raise e to both sides, right? Take the exponential. e to the natural log is going to give me my actual limit. We just pretend we have only that piece. Yeah? And what is e to the 0? Ha ha! 1. Very nice. This is a limit you don't want to forget. It's going to be super useful to have that. That the nth root of n, the limit, as n grows infinitely large, is 1. Oh, how nutty. Now, you might be saying, Dr. Warren, you just said we couldn't use that other rule. Well, you can't. The result is the same, but for very different reasons, right? Very different reasons, OK? So this limit is 1, regardless of whether this guy is constant or whether it's n. That is super awesome. And so we know that this limit now goes to 1 back to what we were actually doing. That, again, is very important for what we're doing going forward, OK? So this limit was 9 tenths times all of this, right? So what do we got? 9 tenths times 1 over 1. So what did we end up with with our root test? 9 tenths, what do we care about? That our L is less than 1, and therefore the root test, right, gives us what? 
absolute convergence, right? Okay, so you see the differences in how to compute things, right? This one, we, you know, these limits will come up a lot in root test, and so that's one of the reasons why we wanted to make sure we spent some time talking about that. Let's do one very quick last example, just so you can see a divergence one, okay? And a factorial one. One very quick last example, and then uh, we'll call this day. <laughs> All right? All right, so um, ratio test and root test, again, they're going to be our go-tos. Realizing when they're useful, right? Not with polynomials and other types of problems like the ones that you guys have been doing prior to this. But let's just look at one factorial problem just to at least give you some work with that before we hit the weekend, okay? Um, let's look at this one, number 14. 11.6, this one will be fast, guys, I promise. 11.6, uh, number 14. Here we have the sum, n equals one to infinity of n factorial over 100 to the n, okay? And again, the question is, it says converge or diverge, check for absolute or conditional convergence, right? Well, here, n factorial is always positive, 100 to the n is always positive, or an is positive, so there's no even question about conditional convergence, right? It's either absolutely convergent or diverges, period, right? Okay? Um, all the terms are positive. Okay, so the factorial is key. Use, use ratio test, right? Okay? Um, the exponent ratio test or root test. Right, the exponential, 100 to the n. That's exponential because this guy, the exponent is varying, right? n to the 100 is a power that also can work, right? Um, with with ratio test, but it depends on what else you got. Okay, if you don't have other things, exponents and factorials are gonna fail. All right, here we go. Quit talking. Um, ratio test. Okay, so what do we do? The limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a n plus 1 over a n, right? It's always good to just write it down so you don't forget it, what it is, what you're doing. Here the absolute values don't matter to us at all because everything is positive. So what is, I draw my fraction, right? That's that fraction bar there. a n is the guy that's already given to me right here, right? So what goes down in the denominator? n factorial over 100 to the n, yeah? What goes up in the numerator? I put an n plus 1 everywhere I see an n, right? And so I'm going to have n plus 1 factorial divided by 100 to the n plus 1. Yes? Are we good here? Okay, this one's moving along. Here we go. What do you do next? You just turn this fraction of fractions into a single fraction, right? And so what do we have? We're going to have n plus 1 factorial in our numerator from this guy and 100 I'm going to again do this in two steps. Pretty soon you're going to get really good at doing this kind of quicker. Um, so we got that piece is coming from there and then this guy's reciprocal is going to flip up so we're going to get this times 100 to the n and this guy times n factorial, right? Yeah? Okay. So um, now what? Now you got to see what can cancel, right? So this is the limit as n goes to infinity. Let's work on the denominator first, right? The exponents, we're pretty good at this now. 100 to the n plus 1, how do I want to rewrite it? 100 to the n times 100, right? Times n factorial, yeah? 100 is a constant, yeah? That guy's a constant, yes? Okay. These two guys depend on n, yes? All right. I've got a 100 to the n up here. Yay! I'm going to be able to cancel it now that I've completely demonstrated I've got it there. So the question is, how do I rewrite n plus 1 factorial, right? Well, let's remember, right, if I think of 5 factorial, what does that mean? 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. We've done this before, right? But what is that? It's 5 times, what is this piece? 4 times 3 times 2 times 1? Good. 4 factorial, right? So you guys tell me, how do I rewrite n plus 1 factorial? And thinking that I want an n factorial, 
Or for more complicated problems, sometimes that's not what you, you know, you're looking for something to cancel. But if I have our n plus one factorial, the first guy is n plus one, the next guy is times n times, right? So times n factorial, right? n plus one factorial. We talked about this before. It's n plus one times n factorial, right? And that's n plus one times n times n minus one factorial, right? Right? So there's lots of different ways to write it. It just depends on what you need for your particular piece. This one's a simple one, so we'll just go with that. All right, what can I do? Okay, I've got an n factorial and an n factorial. I can cancel those two guys. I explicitly see them there, right? I've got 100 to the n and 100 to the n. I can cancel them. I explicitly see them there in a product. So what does my limit become? The limit is n goes to infinity of n plus 1 over 100, right? That's all that's left. 100 is a constant. It's not going anywhere. Numerator is n plus 1. And it's going to infinity. Where is this thing going? Infinity. What do we care about? That's bigger than one, right? Therefore, what does the ratio test tell us? This guy diverges. And that's super important. We're going to pick up on that idea in general. This guy diverges. One of the things that's sort of telling us is that this factorial is growing faster than this. 100 to the n, right? That's an exponential function. Think about that. Ooh, we kind of already talked about that a little, right? Factorial is growing faster than exponential. That's what we're going to pick up with next time. Have a great weekend. Miss you guys. See you next week.